But there is a level to which God is trying to take us. Do we believe that? A place where God is trying to take the church. And let me, let me join my voice with a long line of preachers throughout the years and tell you this much. God did not give you a seat in this house that he didn't intend to put a body in. He didn't give you a seat in the house. He didn't give you square footage in the balcony that he didn't plan on. And I'm not talking about special services. Every time we come together is a special service. If you believe that, shout amen. I'm turning your attention to Matthew. I'm going to take you to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Mm. handful of words the Lord told me to tell this church I wasn't sure what I would preach this morning I wasn't sure and I, I'm not sure how much I'll preach really tonight because once anybody gets a hold of what I say here tonight I won't be able to contain you you won't be able to contain yourself you'll have to respond Matthew chapter 4, this is when Jesus is led of the Spirit into the wilderness, verse 1, to be tempted of the devil. I love the writer here, the conclusion of verse 2, because while they are inspired of the Spirit, you catch a little bit of humanity from time to time. It seems in the writing, he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights seems like there should be a period where there's a comma and the writer seems as though he goes on and says, and he was hungry. I, I think he was after 40 days and 40 nights. But this is when it happens. The tempter came and started tempting Jesus. And in verse 4 he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God and then in verse 5 the devil takes him to the holy city and takes him on the pinnacle of the temple it says if thou be the son of God and in verse 7 Jesus' answer said it's written again thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God and again the devil takes him to an exceeding high mountain and, and this time he says if you'll fall down and, and worship me you can have these Things And Jesus responds here in verse 10. Get thee hence, Satan. Get behind me, devil. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Many theologians say that it was here at verse 12 when the public life and the earthly life and ministry, the facilitating of ministry, began after this time of fasting, temptation, and resistance. Okay? He looked at the devil and said, get the hints. I heard this a lot when I was a kid. I don't hear it much anymore. We, in fact, used to sing about it. Get behind me. Satan, get behind me. It was a, it was a song we sang. Now, I grew up in a small country church. But it was a, it was a kind, of, kind of song that make you kick holes in a drywall. You know, it was a good song. And that's when the devil left him. I have a word from God, and I'm not sure exactly. I think a lot of people that walked up here this morning, I'm preaching to you right now, when I tell you very simple words that I plan to preach to you tonight. The devil is a liar. That's it. That's my word for you tonight. The devil is a liar. In fact, the Bible says that he is the father. If there's a lie in existence, you can trace it and track it back to hell. Because he is a liar, but he is the father of lies. 
And I'm going to tell you it is the will of God that you be empowered by the Holy Ghost tonight. Is that all right? Father, we call on you right now. And I'm asking that you help me somehow to articulate what I feel in my spirit. I feel like you're in this place. This song was intentional. It was intended for our time together. And these scriptures have been intended for our time together. And I'm not sure exactly what you want to do here tonight. But I think you want to allow there to be freedom and deliverance. And so I'm asking that your work would be accomplished in a very mighty and a very powerful way. I'm asking that you would set those that are here tonight freer than they have been in a long time. It is the will of God that every person in this room become responsive to the very manifest presence of God. We are not in this place of our own ability or our own gathering and certainly not of our own grace. But you are the one who has saved us. You are the one who has delivered us. You are the one who reached to where we were and saw us in spite of our condition and picked us up and turned us around and brought us into the church. And we are thankful. And I pray that you would help us to return the blame on the enemy tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And if you feel that way, shout unto the Lord with all of your might. Come on, really shout unto God with all of your might. Somebody shout and allow it to become triumphant. Glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace and goodwill toward men. I forewarn you as you're seated this evening that if I say it once, I'll say it many times. And, and so at the risk of being repetitive, I so endure or ask that you would endure the reality that I'm going to say many times my very simple title. The devil is a liar. He is a liar about the condition of your mind. He is a liar about the condition of your body. He is a liar about the certain space where you stand in the presence of God. He is a liar about what you have accomplished. And he is a liar about what you can accomplish. But until we intentionally verbalize and articulate the reality that we know that, then we do nothing more than go through the motions constantly trying to get victory. I'm going to tell you why some of you here tonight have been in a spiritual slump. You think that this is about you. This is not about you. I'm going to tell you for some of us it's physical. But for some of us what we prayed about tonight and preached about this morning rather and proclaimed authority for the strength to climb many of us have got ourselves to the base of the mountain on our own well that's quiet but that's true I affect my own mind and I affect my own heart by what I see and what I hear and those that I spend my time with like walking through a field and the cockaburrows of the weeds that would grab a hold of the material. We are living in a perverse and a sinful world where there is an extremely subtle but yet intentional serpent named Lucifer that has so set his devices that you don't have to know things. You just pick them up from walking through the world. They did a study and wrote an article, probably multiple articles, some handful of years ago about something called secondhand music. When I was a kid, I often heard about secondhand smoke, but Pastor Tuttle, the article, quite fascinating to read, was about secondhand music. And it was the understanding that we're only a couple of decades removed from where you would not be allowed to play lyrics through the speakers in any public venue. It was elevator music in its introduction, maybe just a little background to break up the uh, monotony of the silence. But then over time, I believe it was a part of hell's agenda to allow hell-laced lyrics 
to casually begin to come through the speakers in even the most public of places. This is why you haven't been listening to it. You weren't turning it on. You weren't engaging in it. But you show up into a local store and a song comes on and all of a sudden you catch yourself singing along. If the pastor was there, might catch yourself. But I think we've all been guilty in that place where you didn't try to learn that. You learned it because it was intentionally. And the article was doing a parallel between secondhand smoke and what it does to the physical body and what secondhand music and those lyrics that are getting lodged in the hearts and the minds of individuals. They are putting a reality into people that is contrary to the life they are even trying to live. It's one of the dangers, not only among our young culture, but even amongst our adults, when we think it's okay to listen to lyrics that we cannot live out. As if it does not matter or would not mean anything. But I would tell you that the world's agenda is very simply been influenced by hell. And its agenda is none other than the enemies himself. It is to steal it is to kill and it is to destroy. I promise you on behalf of heaven that hell does not like songs like the one we just sang. When people get up on a Sunday night church, because we don't even do Sunday night church anymore. Get me started on that. We don't do Sunday night service, but if we have the audacity to do Sunday night service, and then let someone get up and begin to say, you can't have my family. I believe that we have the authority to get hell awfully mad in a building like this. But hell did not ask my permission to attack my family. And I am not going to ask hell's permission to go on the offensive and call him what he is. The devil is a lie. He's told you that you cannot be great for the kingdom of God, but I'm telling you the devil's a liar. He's told some of you parents that your children are never coming home, but I tell you the devil is a liar. I know what I preached this morning, but he's told some of you you're never getting a clean bill of health, but I tell you the devil is a liar. He is a liar with every fiber of his and I've got a word for you. You gotta stop entertaining the lying tongue of the devil. Some of you are gonna have to get your shout back. Some of you are gonna have to get your shout for the first time in your life. I'm not believing the lies of the enemy anymore. And if he wants a war, he's gonna get a war. She showed up. She showed up to service. She became faithful living for God. Came to every service. The problem was when she would go home, her husband would be kicked back in a lazy boy, blaring hard rock and roll, waiting on her to get in. She'd walk in after a powerful Sunday night service. He'd be kicked back with a beer. How's, how's Bible thumping tonight? She said he'd take a, take a drink off of his beer and make fun of her. If you come without your spouse or if you come without a family member, it can be a deflating thing. Because I got a word from God. But then reality hits you in the face. So she went into a time of prayer and intercession, seeking God. Couldn't get an answer. He wouldn't come. Days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months. (laughs) But she was alone in the presence of God. One day she said, "I, I don't know what happened. I just know God took me somewhere deep. And when he did, the Lord gave me a vision and I saw my husband. 
I saw my husband standing in the left side of the altar and he was in a yellow dress shirt. She said when he, he came to the altar, he lifted up his hands. Now, now reality was him sitting there with a beer, but the word from God was. What a great chasm between the two. This is where I picked up the story because I walked down the uh, particular aisle where she had been sitting and there sitting next to her was a yellow dress shirt still in the wrapping. I thought maybe it was pastoral appreciation. This is where she picked up the story. She began to tell and unfold the story. She said, so I went to the closet. And when I went to the closet, I began to look for that yellow dress shirt the Lord had showed me in that vision. She said, but the problem was he didn't have a yellow dress shirt. Now, what do you think the devil told her? She told me, and so the devil tried to say, I told you that wasn't from God. She said, I told the devil you're a liar. She said, I double-checked his size, and I went to the store, and I bought him a yellow dress shirt. Because sometimes you got to invest in your dream. Sometimes you got to be willing to look silly for what you believe. Can I tell you, I don't understand exactly how prayer and intercession works. But I know that it wasn't but a month or so later and he walked into the room. She said, I wasn't ready for it. And I tried not to act surprised. I know I'd prayed, I'd cried, I'd interceded. But sometimes you pray so long you don't know if it's actually going to happen. She said, I, I tried not to act surprised when he came in the room. And he said, I'm, I guess I'll go to church with you today. She said, I, I simply said, okay, that, that'd be great. She said, inside I was doing. You know how, if you haven't ever danced where you kind of look silly, you ought to try that. It, she said, and then he blew my mind because he looked at me and said, and where did this yellow shirt come from? I just thought you'd like it. Well, I might as well wear a new shirt if I'm going to church. He didn't know that I had already known the prophetic promise. Let me make a long story short. I was there the day he lifted his hands in a yellow shirt. I was there the day God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And I was there when I got to put him down in the waters of baptism, in immersion, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. And if you'd go to that church today, that's the man that leads up the pastoral prayer team. That's the man that picks up children on a bus ride. I know the devil told her it would never happen and the devil's told you it will never happen but the devil is a liar he's a liar over Vider he's a liar over Beaumont he's a liar over let me get a little more personal. He's a liar in your mind. He's a liar in your family. And you ought to get a little righteous indignation and square your shoulders on a Sunday evening and say, but I'm taking authority in the power of the Holy God. Because it is written. I want you to throw your hands towards heaven right now. And I want you to start thinking about what he's been tormenting you with. Woo! For many of you, it's got a name attached to it. For some of you, it's depression. For some of you, it's the name of a spouse. For some of you, it's the name of a child. But really, it's all tied back. you got to get past what you're focused on and trace it back to the origination. Get on back to the father of that. you got to get past what you've been... You've been thinking, that's the problem. That's not the problem. The devil is the problem. You're mad at them, but you shouldn't be mad at them. You ought to be mad at the devil. You're trying to get them to do something that... Listen, they need a touch from God... And there is only one thing that can happen to make that occur. You've got to come to the understanding. This is a sin issue. This is a lying issue. 
Now, hands lifted, here's what I want you to do. If you get your mind focused on it, I want you to go right past it. And I want you, you're going to feel some sense of authority come on you because I want you to bypass the problem. My God, I see revelation right now. So many of you have been coming to the problem. You think that's the problem. That's not the problem. This time I want you to push that out of the way in your mind. And I want you to walk right past it. And if you get past it a little bit, you're going to see the outstretched hands of the enemy that keeps pushing that thing forward. Keeps bringing that thing against you. But I've come to tell you tonight that if you will speak the word of God, when you get to where you can begin to see it I want you to start saying it is written it is written let me help you with something right here Why do you think the first thing that the devil tried to do was make Jesus turn those stones to bread? He's been fasting 40 days, 40 nights. The author said he is hungry. He is hungry. But if you do a little study on anatomy, you'll understand how Jesus got out of timing and given prey to that and actually given in. What do you think would have happened to his body had he started eating bread after 40 days? If that would have been his introductory meal, immediate, no food, no water, and turns the stones to bread. The problem is not the problem. The short game was tied to the devil's long game. If I can get you to do this now, I can stop the power of your real death. Because we sing in our churches about the glory of God. Let me t- just be safe. Let me teach just for a second. Just. We talk about the glory of God. We preach about wanting to show me your glory. We, we love it. We love it. We love it. No, we, we don't if we really understand it. We don't even understand the glory of God from the front. The front side, let me give you a brief Bible study on this here, okay? The front side of glory is torture. It really is. What did Moses want to see? He wanted to see the front side of God's glory. He wanted to see the glory of God, the presence of God, the glory. He got hid in the cleft of the rock. What's he get to see? The back side of God's glory. The front side of God's glory is terrifying. You cannot see, you can't see me face to face and really live. You cannot, you don't understand this. The front side of the glory would look like a fiery furnace for Hebrew children. The back side of glory is deliverance. We, we love backside, Pentecostalism, we love backside of glory. The backside of, back of glory is what makes sense to us because we can see it. We, the front side of glory is Lazarus laying dead in a tomb. The back side of glory is Lazarus revived and setting across the table from Christ. The front side of glory is a cross. The back side is resurrection. We understand? Understand that? So here we are at the front side of God's glory and Jesus is in this place where he is in the front side of the glory. It's in the front, the front part, the part that is miserable. Fasting is miserable. If you don't think it's bad, I want to know your secret. Fasting's miserable. Who would be honest right here and just say you hate fasting? Well, hate's a strong word. You hate fasting. You just don't like it. The pastor calls a fast, and you hope it's a fast fast. <laughs> Who now would also be honest and tell me, 40 days sounds horrible. Because I love deliverance. I love the ministering power of Christ. But I do not love the process of Christ. I love the power of freedom. I love when you sing it right. But I don't love when I have to live my way through it. Uh Uh-huh. I don't love when I got a fast extended I don't love when I've got to pray until it hurts. I don't love when I have to endure it. But the reality is the model of Christ was, regardless of the circumstance, if you can learn to deny your flesh, 
when the enemy shows up with a lie. When the enemy shows up and tells you they're never coming back. When the enemy shows up and tells you you're never getting a breakthrough. When you have learned in prayer and fasting how to deny your flesh. You can learn how to deny his voice. Uh huh. When they show up at your house and tell you that there will never be anything but chaos. You're able to say it is written. I'm going to focus in on something here right now. You're in the middle of a marriage problem. I don't want any. I want everybody just throw your hands towards heaven right now. Everybody throw your hands towards heaven. I don't want anybody feeling alienated. But you hear this preacher right now. You've been in the middle of a marriage problem. I don't know if it's that your husband is not coming with you. But you hear this preacher right now. I've watched too many men come to God. I've watched too many that said they never would because of the powerful prayer. I know I'm speaking to a woman right now. And I want you to hear what I'm saying. It is written and I believe that you've got power in your fasting and I believe that you got power in your prayer because your prayer connects you to God now if you believe that shout amen, amen. the devil continues to press at Christ now pastor my most frustrating part of this story is that Jesus keeps letting him Elder, don't let him keep talking to you. Tell you right now, because if I came to you, if I'm one of your saints and I come talk to you and I tell you what the devil is telling me, you're going to say, get away from the devil. And Jesus just keeps following. Being led by him. Because he had become comfortable in the wilderness the Bible says he was led of the spirit into the wilderness man I got to touch this stuff forgive me for taking allow me to take this time he's led of the spirit into the wilderness there's a difference between isolation and solitude there's a difference for those of you that have been battling depression there's a difference between isolation that is not of God and solitude that is of God solitude is where you Get alone with God. Just you and your devotion in solitude. Because I promise you, if you can learn how to whip things in solitude, when you come to church, you appreciate it on a different level. You cannot, when you have a life of solitude where prayer and devotion is real to you, you don't come to church and be like, I can't believe they're singing that again. He's not even, he's not, he, oh, there he got it. Okay, he got it. It was okay. I wonder what time he's going to be done sitting on the steps and talking. wonder when he'll yell a little bit more so that we can program. When you learn how to win in solitude, you come into the church feeling different. You come into the church prepared. Some of you are just your emotions. You're, you're, you're ready. You come into church ready to beat hell to death. And some of you get annoyed with those personality people. I watched it. I observed intentionally during prayer tonight. Some of you just real quiet in your pew. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Others are pacing back and forth. God! Why is that? Just personality. But I have found that the most reserved of folks when they get in the middle of a real war could care less about posture, protocol, professionalism. And I'm going to tell you solitude causes such things because solitude where you're truly alone with God in prayer and you're truly alone with God in times of fasting it'll put you into a place where the devil will be very aware of what you're doing. The seven sons the sons of Sceva taught us something. You shouldn't be intimidated when the devil doesn't know your, or does know your name. You should be intimidated when he doesn't. Because it's dangerous to try to have church and not actually have God. It's very scary to have the shout of God, but no God of the shout. 
And if we're not careful, we're programmed to do such things. But I'm here tonight on assignment from God to tell you. You're going to need this on Monday. And you're going to need this on Tuesday. And you're going to need this on Wednesday. And I, listen, I really, honestly, I don't know your life. I don't know who I'm talking to. But somebody, by the time you get out of bed in the morning, you're barely stepping across your bedroom. And you're overwhelmed. And somebody's going to start talking in tongues in your bedroom tomorrow morning when you square your shoulders and you tell the devil you're a liar I'm tired of being overwhelmed mentally I'm tired of being overwhelmed I got in the presence of God and I was reminded that I am more than a conqueror through him I can do this with God on my side now here's what I want us to do. Listen, we got to do some group exercises if we're going to get to this. I want everybody with hands stretched as high as you can now. I want everybody to audibly shout as loud as you can unto God. Just begin to shout it. I want to hear how it comes out. I'm doing this on purpose. I want to see how awkward it feels to you. You've got to go on the offensive. You've got to turn this back on the enemy. You've got to get this resistance mindset. I am tired of letting him lead me around. I am tired of listening to his lies. I am tired of hearing his tongue. I am tired of hearing his voice. The devil is a liar. He's told you you can't be a worshiper. The devil's a liar. He's told you you don't have the ability to run aisles anymore. The devil's a liar. He told you you don't have the right to dance in the presence of God. The devil is a liar. He told you that you don't have authority to still. You still got the authority to put your hand. Come on, put your hands on the sick and believe they'll recover. Put your hands over your family and plead the blood. Brother Trimble, either we just sing about it or we really believe it. Either we're Pentecostal or we're not. Either we believe in the power of the written word of God or we do not. But I preach to you tonight that he's a liar and I want him to know that I know the truth. Come on, the only freedom I really know comes from the truth. I was preaching in North Texas. I was preaching in North Texas and I was preaching a story about Joe Ash and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Elisha at the end of his life. And Joe Ash shows up and I'm talking about striking the arrows. You know, we, if, you, if you can't preach at all, you can preach that message. And I... Preach about striking the arrows and one little old girl, she ran up to the altar. She's standing there in the altar area and she's looking at me real patiently. I had these arrows in my hand and I knew what she wanted. She wanted to strike those arrows. She's looking at me. And I'm preaching, you know, trying to go on and preaching. But she was adamant. I'm telling you, boy, she was adamant. And so I looked down. I said, what is it, babe? She said, I want to strike those arrows. I want to strike those arrows. And so I gave her the arrows. I thought maybe she'd stay. No, 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 no. Right up on the platform. Here she came. Now we get nervous, but I have a tendency to get comfortable with aggressive people. I, and so she came up and grabbed those arrows. And I don't mean she went, she didn't do no patty cake for Pentecost type of hitting those arrows. Okay? She didn't do no like, oh Jesus, and I just thank you for another day. No, she meant business. She meant war. Yeah, that's what she did. She striked, man, pop, pop. Man, I'm trying to preach and I look over. I was so moved by her striking the arrows. I stopped and just prayed over. Just pray. And I mean, she was striking them harder and harder and harder. And I wasn't close enough to hear what she was saying. I'd hear a little bit of English, then a little bit of tongues, then a little bit of English, then a little bit of tongues. And she was snotting and crying and praying and seeking and hitting. I mean, I had carbon arrows and there was carbon flying. People are dodging, doing the... And she's striking them. 
We went on with service. It turned into a thing. Every kid wanted to come and grab the air. Here we go, man. They're exploding. And some would say, man, that's just emotionalism. That's just, that's just semantics trying to prove something. Go through some little, little here we go, a little cute little illustration. Because, you know, young people only just play church anyway. That's another message. And, and Man, I wasn't ready for it. I got to be honest. I didn't know what she was praying for. But we went on, had a powerful service. And as we were ending the service, we it probably two hours later, it was long service. Here she came in from the back and she's trying to get my attention. Brother Carson, Brother Carson. And I wasn't recognizing in the moment. I said, oh yeah, babe, what is it? Thank you for, for worshiping so hard tonight. She said, I got to tell you something, Brother Carson. Tears, here they came again. Water works down her cheeks. She said, Brother Carson, you don't understand. She said, when I grabbed those arrows, I felt like I had a word from God that you got to claim your daddy I said well baby I believe with you I believe she said no 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 listen brother Carson she said after I walked down off of this platform I began to seek God she said my, my phone started ringing in my pocket and I looked down it was my mom and I ignored it because we were here trying to praise and I was trying to dance she said she called me multiple times and I, I thought maybe something's wrong and so I picked it up I couldn't hear her and, and I found my way out into the foyer she said brother Carson when I finally was able to hear my mom she said girl I don't know what happened she said but I was in the back room she said and when I just walked out of our bedroom and into the living room your daddy was leaned over in the living room with tears streaming down his cheeks speaking in other tongues as the spirit of Ah, that stuff don't work. The devil is a liar. If I've come to do nothing else, I've come to challenge the power of your prayer. I've come to challenge the power of your Pentecostal lifestyle. When you pray, you ought to believe it comes to pass. When you resist the devil, you ought to believe he's going to flee from... He's got to flee from you. But he will not flee because you know me enough, I can preach this and you understand. He will not, he will not flee from you because you know how to dress right. He will not flee from you because we do a church remodel. He will not flee from you because you know how to hit a minor or a major on the right time. He will not flee from you because you have the ability to run your octave. He will not flee from you because you just attend church. You need to. You need to be faithful. I've got news for you, and this is where it's a little bit tricky. He will not even flee from you because you read the Word. Because there is a difference between knowing the Word and speaking the Word. It's one thing for you to preach it to me. It's another thing for me to preach it to him. I'm not a preacher. You are a preacher. You're the devil's worst preacher. I said you're the devil's most hated preacher. Well, I'm not a, pre I'm not a public speaker. No, that's good because most of this won't happen in public. Most of this will happen when you're standing in your bedroom or when you're down in your basement or when you're on the job site and your boss is acting like a devil in clothing. Hey, most of this will happen when nobody's around but you and God and the devil creeps in on your mind and he starts to distract you and starts to destroy you or your daughter or your son comes in again and they're still not back in the fold and the devil shows up and said, I told you they're never coming back to live for God. That's when most of your preaching, now I know some of you have never felt like a preacher and the only time you hear this concept is when you think that you're supposed to be a witness to other people but I'm going to give you a little divine revelation right now. When God God gave you the Holy Ghost. He gave you the, the ability to become hell's most hated preacher. I feel like hell's most hated preacher right now. I got to be honest because I got a report today that we've already registered over 34,000 some people to gather into a football stadium in the face of North America. Can I tell you I've come under attack mentally and I've come under attack physically and I've come under attack spiritually but I got news for that liar. I got news for that devil. It is written man I feel
feel like preaching. I don't even feel like preaching to you. I feel like preaching to the devil. I feel like telling him I'm more than a conqueror. I feel like telling him I can do all things. I feel like telling him it is going to be all right. I feel like preaching to the devil. I am a worshiper from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I'm a preacher when I feel good, but I'm a preacher when I feel bad. I'm a preacher on a good day, but I'm a preacher on a bad day. I'm a preacher when the sun's up, but I'm a preacher in the midnight hour because I, because I got a word from God. If you got a word from God, you ought to begin to act on it right now. You ought to begin to worship. I wish somebody would run the aisles right now. If you've ever ran the aisles, I wish you'd run the aisles. Run them again. Somebody start going out with them. Come on until something breaks in this room. Come on, activate your voice box. When you start praising, when you live that life of worship, you are hell's most hated preacher. Come on, let Christ be resident in you. I don't know how long it's been. I got a feeling some of you haven't danced in a while. You ought to just dance a little bit. I'm gonna make hell mad and I know it. I'm gonna cause the enemy to recognize I know who I am in God. I know you can do it when there's singing, but can you do it when there's no music? He's a liar. He's a liar over your marriage. He's a liar against your mind. He's a liar against your finances. I don't know what's been imparted over the last year to this congregation. I don't know what hives have been stirred up. I don't know what's been happening with some families, but I do know this. The conditions I told you this morning are right for climbing, but I feel some witness in my spirit. Let me ask you this question. All of you that have been raised in the church, How do you overcome? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of God read to us. By the word that pastor preaches. You know what he said? You overcome when you start preaching. I know I couldn't be here if it wasn't for the blood. Jesus was not confused. You want me to make those stones to bread? No, it's written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's why it's dangerous when you can quote more movie lines than you can Bible verses. It's dangerous because you can't live by that. You can't live by song lyrics. That's like cotton candy. It tastes good, but it's empty and it'll kill you if that's your only diet. The foolishness of preaching. The problem is we always deflect that to someone else's responsibility. Man, I feel revelation in this. I feel revelation in this room right now. Some light bulbs turning on here. Comes on, he takes him on and begins to tempt him again. And what was his it is? Ah. Ah. It's, hey, hey, pastor, I'm, I'm having a bad day. Hey, pastor, I'm having, I'm having a bad day. Then preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm, 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 not, a, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm not a pre- Yes, you are. And if you can't preach to your problem, you sure can't preach to your neighbor. I promise you, if you're going to win with them, you got to win this one first. I'm talking about a holy boldness that will cause you to square your shoulders. Jesus had no physical strength left. He was not hydrated from water. He was malnourished from no lack of substance. But when he felt no substance in his physical body, the spiritual man was renewed because he was able to meditate on the word of God. And when the enemy showed up, it wasn't going to be a gourmet meal to fix it. It wasn't going to be the angels and a timbrel to fix it. He wasn't going to have the psalmist show up with some great choir or orchestra. He couldn't ask Brother Ryan Trimble to show up and sing the choir song. No, there was none of that. His answer in that dark moment was, it is written. It is written. It is. And the only thing to get a lie out of your mind is to fill it with the truth. I said the only way to get a lie out of your mind is to fill it with the truth. He shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, they may play in a few moments, but I don't even want music for a moment. The Bible says that you're the instruments. You're the instruments. Now I asked you a moment ago to to label it, to identify it, whatever it is. If you battle pornography, that's what it is. If you battle addiction, alcoholism, that's what it is. If you battle being a negative person, that's what it is. It's different for every person. Same way it played out in prayer service with our personality, it plays out in our minds. It's just different. You got your vices, I got mine. Don't matter how long I preach. If I don't stay connected to the Spirit of God... Oh, God. And so in that moment, as you begin to identify it, now I'm going to ask you something that you have probably never been asked to do. I'm going to tell you for a moment, I'm going to tell everybody in the room, elders, some of you elderly ladies, here's the deal. You're better preachers than anybody knows. Some of you have been preaching to grandkids and babies for a long time. I remember my grandma picked me up on her knee. She didn't even know it, but she was preaching. She's preaching. We call it, sometimes we call it intercession. And I don't have time to flesh this out totally. But I'm going to tell you what happens here. In a moment, I'm going to tell you to pre, every person in the room, I want you to preach to your problem. (laughs) See how awkward that felt? Maybe we could just do the shout thing. No, I'm going to tell you to preach to your problem. Because if we're not careful in Pentecost, a little bit of a teaching spirit on me tonight. If we're not careful in Pentecost, we only pray in tongues and we never pray in English. Don't misunderstand this. You need to speak with tongues every day. You need to get to that place. But sometimes I watch this. I give a young adult the microphone and they get up in in the mic and they mean well, but they pray prayers like this. And Lord God, I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that God, you're good. And and Jesus, I just thank you for your righteousness, God, and your amazing Lord God. And Jesus, Father, I pray that you would just... It'd be like you talking to me and saying, Josh, I just want you, Josh, to know, Josh, that Josh, that Father Josh, that you are. But then you let them start, and then here's what I watch. They start praying in tongues, and it's powerful. Because it's the only prayer life that we cultivate. I can tell how much time someone actually spends in prayer with God by whether or not they're actually able to spend any amount of time in English praying with God. Oh man, that went over like a lead balloon. But that's good teaching right there. In your native language, being able to identify the problem and call the problem what it is. And look at that problem and say, but I know that it is written in the word of God that I am a, come on, I am a joint heir with God. 
I am able to look at you and tell you on a Sunday night that I'm not believing your lies. And you're going to watch here in a minute. When you start preaching, it will shift. There will be a noticeable moment. You'll start preaching to hell. Because when you start preaching to your problem, this is going to feel awkward at a moment, but I'm, help, I'm, I'm allowing some of you to save years on your prayer journey. Some of you, it's going to take exponential growth in this moment. You're going to pray different after this. It's going to be awkward for about the first 30 seconds. Okay, I tell you that. But after we get through that and you get to that place, you will get to where you reach past that thing. You will start cursing hell. Some of you violently in this house. Because make no mistake, he wants your family destroyed. I am not confused about this. Pastor Tuttle, he wants your family destroyed. He wants your mind destroyed. He wants your body destroyed. He wants you overwhelmed. He wants you to feel bombarded. He wants your children taken out. He wants your marriage to fail. He wants your finances to crumble. He wants your Sunday school department to be wrecked. He wants your emotions to be on the rocky. He wants your life destroyed. And you're about to tell him, no. We don't care what he wants. We want what he wants. Because the other part of that verse is while he came to steal, to kill, and destroy. The Bible says that Jesus came. That we might have life and life more abundantly. So here we go. All right? Here we go. This is this is abnormal. This is no music. This is every hand lifted right now. Oh, I felt that right there. Some of you are worried to speak to it because you're worried if somebody's gonna hear you. Everybody's gonna pray so loud, nobody's gonna hear you. Everybody's gonna everybody's gonna pray so loud, nobody's gonna hear you. I speak right now to the mental battle that has been coming against me. Come on, go ahead and do it. I speak right now to that thing that's been trying to overwhelm my mind. You've been showing up without invitation. You've been showing up and I didn't ask you to come. I know that you are sent from hell. Come on, that's all the leading I can give you. Come on, I don't want you to pray in tongues yet. I want you to speak English to it. Come on, you've been fighting with your spouse. Been overwhelmed by your children. Come on, speak to it. Been showing up and rearing your ugly head. Trying to take dominion in my family. Nobody knows it, but you've been showing up. Trying to make me feel overwhelmed. Come on, I want you to speak to it. Come on, lift your voice a little bit now. Come on, I don't want you to fizzle out. I want you to get a little stronger now. I want you to let it turn into righteous indignation. But I'm getting sick of it. I'm getting sick of this. God, I'm getting sick of this.
I want you to begin to rebuke the devourer now. I rebuke the devourer from my mind. I rebuke the devourer from my family. I rebuke the devourer over my emotions. I rebuke the devourer of my children. Come on, we're still in English. I rebuke him. Come on, you're the head and not the tail. Come on, you are the one that is meant to be victorious. I rebuke the devourer. Come on, don't get confused in this. What we're doing right here should mirror what you're doing almost every day. Don't get confused in this. Come on, if you don't know how to pray it, begin to call out the names of your children. Begin to call out the name of your spouse. Begin to call out the names of coworkers. I rebuke the devourer over their life. I rebuke the devourer from Canaan. I rebuke the devourer from Cadence, from Carver, from Cation. I rebuke the devourer from Rachel I rebuke the enemy off my family come on somebody tell him get your grip off my mind I rebuke the devourer off of this school. I rebuke the devourer off this community. I rebuke the devourer. The addiction that's rampant. Abuse. Oh, God. Abuse that's run rampant. We rebuke the devourer. If you don't know what else to say, I want you to just start mingling your mouth with the message and just start saying it again and again. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Come on, convince yourself the devil is a liar. There is no truth in him. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Come on, now lift your hands. And I want you to begin to worship God. I feel angels now. The Bible said ministering angels were dispensed unto Christ in that moment. Woo, God. I feel ministering angels in the atmosphere. When the ministering angels show up, it's all right. The Holy Ghost will touch you. You begin to walk in the Spirit. You begin to pray in the Spirit. Some of you need to begin to pray almost violently in tongues. Some of you need to get into a depth of intercession. There is a place that the now where the English does not know what to say, where only the Spirit itself can have the groanings and the travail. Come on, the Spirit knows every verse you've forgotten. The Spirit knows every promise that you've denied. The Spirit knows every promise that you've cast in on. The Spirit will make intercession. You've done your part. Now allow there to be 